There's a saying long attributed to the playwright George Bernard Shaw that youth is wasted on the young. And while Shaw may not have said those exact words, the sentiment they convey, the, the longing to preserve the vitality of youth is just about as old as our ability to write about it. 2,500 years ago, the great Greek chronicler Herodotus wrote of remote villages whose populace bathed in special waters and lived to be 120. And across the ages, the legend of such a fountain of youth persisted. It may be, in fact, that the Spanish settlement of Florida was an unintended consequence of Juan Ponce de Leon's search for such a fountain somewhere in the Caribbean. Now, a cursory look at Florida's population suggests that the search has yet to succeed. But today, the search for a metaphorical fountain of youth has the weight of science behind it. And we can see the results. Medical and public health advancements over the past century have helped to double life expectancy. Now, how much farther can we go? A world in which middle age refers to someone who is 100 or 150. A world in which the human health span is nearly as long as the human lifespan. A world in which aging can be slowed or even reversed. A world that is in which the human lifespan might be virtually unlimited, suggesting that we might be among the last human generation to have such a pitifully short lifespan. Joining me today are four leading researchers who are making extraordinary contributions to understanding what makes us age and who in various ways are developing treatments that could help mitigate, reverse, and prevent the impact of aging. First guest is Nir Barzilai, who is the founding director of the Institute for Aging Research, director of the Nathan Schock Center of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging, and also the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Human Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine at the Montefiore Health System. He directs the Longevity Genes Project, which studies over 750 centenarians. He joins us from his home in New York. Welcome, Nir. And our next guest is Alyssa Eppel, who is a professor as well as the vice chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. She's the president of the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research and is co-author, along with Nobel Prize winning author Elizabeth Blackburn, of a best-selling book called The Telomere Effect. She joins us from San Francisco. Welcome, Alyssa. Our next guest is Laura Niedenhofer, who is the director of the Institute on the Biology of Aging and Metabolism at the University of Minnesota, where she is also a professor of biochemistry, molecular biology, and biophysics. Prior to that, she was at the Scripps Research Institute, where she helped develop a new class of drugs which selectively kill senescent cells, which are key drivers of aging. She joins us from her office in Minneapolis. Welcome, Laura. And finally, our last guest is David Sinclair, who is a professor of genetics and co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for Biology of Aging Research at Harvard Medical School, where he directs his own lab. He is the co-author of a best-selling book entitled Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. He joins us from Boston. Welcome, David, and welcome to you all. I want to begin with a question that I would love all of you to just quickly, briefly weigh in on. You all are pioneers, right, in various aspects of the science of, of aging, longevity. So just to get a feel for where you come down your thinking about the subject, do you see aging as some kind of um, inevitable wearing down that sooner or later everybody has got to face? Or is aging really something better thought of as a, an affliction? a malady that maybe really can be conquered. So, so Nir, where do you come down on that? Oh, I wish you asked David first, because aging is the mother of all diseases. Aging drives all those diseases that we don't want to get, you know, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. 
it's the cause of that. And so in a way, aging is a disease and I, I, I don't think we should ex uh, accept it um, as much as we don't accept of having Alzheimer or any one of those diseases. The thing that David and I don't agree about is whether we should fight to make aging a disease or we can find a way to deal with it as a disease without calling it that way for for reasons that are totally not scientific, for reasons of how do we bring coalition to allow us to target aging and delay all those diseases and stop them and maybe pre reverse them. So David, what's your, your view of that then in response to Nir's view? So I'm very much of the belief that at least within science and between scientists that we should regard aging as a medical condition, if not a disease. And the World Health Organization has agreed with me but I think we have to ease people into it because it is a shock to think of aging as something we can address potentially with a pill or changes in lifestyle. Uh, but I think that is a, it's an important point that we can slow aging and even potentially reverse it with the kind of discoveries that have been made recently. And in that way, we, can, we will be able to treat aging and prevent it the same way we do with cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. That's yeah, hugely so exciting can, and can optimistic. I, yeah, go ahead, Nir. Can, can, I, can I talk about easing it, okay? about the concept of easing it. Why do we need to ease it? Because the elderly who we want to help, right? They don't want to be called sick. The AARP, their main organization, doesn't want to call aging disease. American Federation of Aging Research doesn't want to call aging a disease. But most important, FDA, okay? We need the FDA so that we can purpose drugs to target aging. They don't want to call aging a disease. And we found out that we don't need to. You know, we're going to give a treatment that prevent age-related diseases. This is fine for now. So I think this is the easing part uh, of that. But if we just come out today and say, let's call aging a disease, we're not going to have the coalition that we need in order to come from the promise to, to the realization of that. Well, okay. So I think all of us probably agree that biological aging underlies disease. It's the pre precursor of most diseases. And so it is true that the target of our efforts should be slowing biological aging. It is a natural process that is inevitable and we have some control over that process. We can slow it, we can compress disease toward the end of life and die of old age in a healthy, high-functioning way or of diseases that last very short periods. And that is about healthy aging and a long health span. But to say, you know, it's a disease, that means it's something we can eradicate and it's, and it's, it, it's something that shouldn't happen. And that's just, to me, ridiculous. Laura? I agree with Alyssa. It just, I think of aging as it, it's going to happen. Uh, it, it's a, a natural process. It, it, and it's just a slow decay of your ability to fix things, correct things, get back to even keel. And I come at this from studying repair mechanisms within a cell. And they fail after a while. And we see this all the time as we measure what we call the, the pillars of the biology of aging. And so I think of it as pretty much inevitable, but very much modifiable. And that's what we're excited about. Well, let's get into some of the details then and see where we can come down on these various perspectives. So Nir, you spend time studying, I guess what you call, or the field call super agers, people who are well above 100 years old, a, a large group of them, some like more than 700 or so, isn't that right in your study? And, and obviously the question is, is there some commonality between these people? Is it the case that, for instance, they're eating really well, dieting, exercising, getting all the amount of sleep that medical science says that we should? Is that what the key to the super agers is? So that's a fascinating uh, question. And my answer uh, is going to shock people because I'm going to tell you, no, there is no effect on the environment on 100 years old, okay? But... Oh, and, and in fact, you know, 60% of the men and 30% of the women were heavy smoker. More than 50% of them are obese and overweight, uh, exercising less than 50% even doing 
housework or walking or biking, and vegetarians are only 2%. But this is the point. This is true to them. Because actually what they have, they have longevity, what we call longevity genes that slows their aging process. And therefore, they can do things longer. I mean, I don't want anybody to say, oh, the secret to longevity is not what I'm doing. I should be more obese. I should smoke. That's not the case. That's the case for them. We do find specific longevity genes. We find some that are more public and some that are more... A private, and actually two of those genes have been already used uh, to have a treatment. Uh, you, you know, when we find genetic um, signals, it doesn't mean that we have to have genetic uh, changes. It just means that this is the mechanism and we can develop a drug. And two drugs have already been established based in part on our centenarians. And, and so these longevity genes, presumably they're different from the absence of negative genes, bad genes, genes that would code for the kinds of diseases that we usually associate with old age. Is that, is that correct? So that's another surprise, and it's a great question. We, when we started, I'll give you this example. When we had our 44 centenarians that had the whole, their whole genome sequence, okay? So we had no control, just centenarians, and we asked, do they have those bad genes for Alzheimer's, for diabetes, for everything else? And we found they had on average five to six genotype that should have made them sick. Okay, there, there's a, a database that said those variants will probably make you sick. And, and for example, they had strong, that we have two men that have strong genetics for Alzheimer's, what's called the ApoE4 homozygosity that sh they should be demented at 70 and dead at 80, and they were not demented at 100. So they can harbor very bad genotypes because they have genes that slows their aging enough to delay for enough time or totally prevent those diseases. It's amazing. Alyssa, you also study genetic characteristics, telomeres, which certainly were, I remember there's a period when they were in the news all the time described as sort of the, the, the genetic marker of aging. Can you tell us about telomeres, their relevance to aging? Yes, um, absolutely. I have been studying them for several, um, almost two decades now. Um, I do just want to add, I do really appreciate David's view of, you know, of think of eradicating aging because it pushes the envelope, because it, it really creates excitement and funding for anti-aging mechanisms and drugs. And it's, it's a really exciting field. And, and, and that idea is um, extremely motivating to people. So David, I didn't mean to come down too hard on the aging as a disease idea. All right, that's okay. <laughs> we'll get back to that. So um, telomeres, I have studied them as a window into rate of aging. And Laura mentioned the hallmarks of aging. There are many interrelated mechanisms of aging, and some are more important than others. They're more, uh, you know, in a, in a network, they are uh, powerful nodes. And so, but they're all, it, they're, it's a cell system that's regulated and they're talking to each other. So mitochondria are one of the mechanisms and they're talking to telomeres and they really um, are intertwined in their health. They go down together into dysfunction or they stay healthy together. And what Laura studies, the, the how cells become senescent and stick around, is probably one of our most biggest clues and powerful nodes to aging. And telomeres fit into that pathway. So telomeres protect the genome. They're non-coding uh, base pairs in every cell that protect our chromosomes. But they're highly regulated. And so when they uh, get too short, the cell can go into cell cycle arrest, and it can also die. Um, but most commonly, it becomes an old senescent cell. When the telomeres start screaming out signals of we're too short, watch out, we could become a cancer cell, it becomes a, you know, kind of a non-functioning senescent cell that secretes inflammation. And of course, I want to hear this from our expert, um, Laura, about what senescence looks like as a pathway for aging. So telomeres are part of that. They- And uh, where, where are they uh, on the- uh 
chromosome? So they're at the tips of the chromosomes. And they're a very, very um, small part, but very important. And they respond to the signals in the cell, in the blood that's in the cell. And I'm going to talk about stress in a very general way. So signals that indicate intracellular stress are talking to the telomere maintenance system. Telomeres are maintained by telomerase, an enzyme that protects them. And when there's a lot of uh, glucocorticoids around, this is impairing the telomerase activity, so it can't keep the telomere long, stable, and healthy. And it also creates a lot of reactive oxygen species, uh, both directly and through the mitochondria. And so this can lead to short telomeres to the extent we get telomere dysfunction, a critical shortness. And what we know in humans is that in many population studies, if you have average short telomeres in your blood, you are more likely to develop diseases early in life and to die earlier. So they're very reliable, but small predictors in humans. We know exactly their mechanism. They, they lead to a replicative senescence to cells not being able to keep dividing. Um, but they are just one part of this network. They're an important part of this network of aging. I mean, do we find, I mean, going back to Nier's work, do you find that in the superagers, do they have longer telomeres? Is it a direct association of that sort? Or is it much more complex? Yeah, yeah we, we published that. Uh, our centenarians have longer telomeres than uh, eight years old. Their children also have longer telomeres than age match control. And we even found uh, some genetic association with the system that regulates a, a telomere length, which is the telomerase uh, system. So the, we do have evidence, but I have to tell you the causation it has not been established in, you, you know, I think that as, as you started saying, it's a biomarker, it's more of a biomarker of aging. I think it's clear that when you have longer telomeres, by the way, not too long because they are risk for cancer, but when you have longer telomeres, you're probably doing better. The cause effect and what are, what's the importance in aging hasn't been causally linked, but, but it's associated. Yeah. Near, I have to say there is so much data in humans. The mice model is not relevant here when it comes to telomeres. They are so long, they do not die of short telomeres. But in humans, there is converging evidence, as much evidence as you can have in humans, since we can't manipulate telomeres directly, that there is a causal pathway. So besides the genetic disorders with the low telomerase and early death, we have Mendelian randomization studies of low telomerase or telomere, low telomerase genes or short telomere genes predicting common diseases of aging earlier. So that's as that's direct and causal in a, as much as we can get with humans. But but then, but then uh, let me ask you then, uh, if you're saying mice telomere, uh, telomeres are long, so they are not good for human aging. How come mice are aging within three years and humans are aging within 80 years, right? It really means that telomeres, uh, are, telomeres are not the major driving of aging because aging happens so much more uh, <laughs> faster in animals. Yeah. So in, in the animal model, it's when we have these long-lived species that we see that um, we can more easily see that it's that shortening of telomeres that is contributing, it's predicting. And maybe it's more marker than mechanism, but to say there's no mechanism in it, it's been so well mapped out in, in so many models. And uh, you know, in birds, it's a, it's a, a very good predictor of, of their longevity and you can manipulate telomeres in different ways and shorten longevity um, with glucocorticoids even. Laura, I want to bring you into the conversation. Alyssa made reference to cell senescence as one of the parts of the pathway that telomeres are, are connected with. That's an area in which your work focuses. Can you give a sense of what that is and its relevance to aging? Sure. Well, cellular senescence is a response of an individual cell to stress. And so we're all made up of 
over a trillion cells. And so these are, you know, think of, you have to think at the cellular level right now. So if a cell detects that it's stressed for a variety of reasons, and it could be short telomeres, it could be DNA damage anywhere in the genome or mitochondrial stress, then it's going to activate a, a signaling pathway that will cause that cell to have a stable arrest of its cell cycle. So what that means is it's not going to replicate its genome and it's not going to produce any more daughter cells. And that is a very, very potent tumor suppressor mechanism. So it prevents that damaged stress cell from turning into a cancer. So that's lovely. So we like senescence. It's good for us. It's also very important in an acute fashion for wound healing and other physiological processes. But the problem is, as we get older, I think that inevitable decay leads to more and more stress and then more and more senescent cells. And um, one of their key features is they have a very robust secretome. So they're sending out signals to their environment all of the time. And these signals are meant to attract immune cells to get rid of these stress damaged cells. And unfortunately, our immune system decays in function over, as we age as well. So we, we're, we're making more senescent cells. We're not clearing them as, as much as we should. And this leads to a state of chronic inflammation that we believe is, is one of the hallmarks of aging that puts you on a platform where you're set up to be vulnerable to a number of different diseases, all of the diseases of old age. So starting to ask a very basic question, I think all of us have, have a sense of what inflammation is at a macro level, redness, puffiness, swollen. What does it mean at, at a cellular or uh, even a molecular level? What does inflammation mean at that scale? Well, it, it means your immune system is, is revved up a bit and that you've got a lot of molecules that are secreted from these immune cells or the senescent cells. And they're just triggering um, kind of, I think of it as misinformation, cross wiring of, of some of the um, signals that your body would like to receive to work in a healthy, coordinated fashion. And so this is particularly true with senescent cells. I think they're giving false signals to the immune system and just kind of screwing up the wiring in the body. And we saw this very clearly when we started to study, for instance, the role of senescent cells in causing bad outcomes in COVID-19. The immune system in the elderly was unable to mount a healthy immune response because they're getting cross signals from their, their senescent cells. And it really screws everything up. So that misinformation is a nice segue to you, David. I know that your focus has been on trying to find what I guess I would call the, the, in physics we call it the holy grail, trying to find the unified theory, the fundamental guiding principles that govern the particles and the laws, and Einstein looked for it and we're still on his trail trying to find the unified theory of physics. You're kind of trying to find a unified theory that would talk about all of these processes of aging in a manner that might allow us to have a, a cogent, coherent organization, perhaps, that would allow us to really find the root cause of aging. And I think that you think that you found that root cause, and it has to do with information. Can you tell us what your thinking is on that? Yeah, well, so about 15 years ago, we came together as a field with these uh, nine hallmarks of aging, and we be it became much less controversial to be in this field, unfortunately. Uh, so we all got along. Uh, but then I thought I'd throw something out there that, that people could could attack. And, and the idea is that uh, it started 20 years ago. I was uh, actually more than that. I was 26 years old working at MIT. And I was part of a group that discovered that a set of longevity genes that could extend lifespan in yeast cells uh, were working effectively and could control the response to diet and to temperature. Uh, and these genes were called sirtuins. Well, we, we ended up calling them sirtuins. And the SIR part of that name stands for Silent Information Regulator. And that just means these genes controlled other genes in what we now regard as the epigenome. And uh, so I've, I've been working on that idea ever since, um, trying to figure out if what we learn in yeast cells, the control of other genes, the epigenome, was also relevant to our own aging process. 
Uh, and we've been trying to disprove that hypothesis for, for over two decades, and we haven't been able to disprove it. So I figured I may as well put it out there uh, as a possible valid theory. And the idea is that there are really two types of information in the body. There's the genome, which is the genetic information, the, the ACTG, this is digital information. And then there's the other type of information in the body, which we don't talk about as much, mainly because we didn't have the tools to read that information until recently. And the epigenome consists of the three dimensional structure of the DNA loops. And uh, so you could see that the, the loops of DNA, the double, double helix, is wrapped around proteins. These are called histones. And then those proteins are wrapped together to form eventually a structure that we call the chromosome. And at the very tips are those telomeres. And the idea is that it's not so much the loss of the genetic material, the DNA, as we age, that's causing aging, which is a very old theory going back more than 60 years now. My idea, and, and, and some others, uh, is that it's the epigenetic information that is lost over time. In other words, if we use an analogy uh, that I like, which is uh, a DVD player, uh, and for the very young viewers uh, and listeners, these are little uh, discs that we used to put movies on. Uh, that the digital information is the is the code for the movie, and the epigenome is the the laser that reads that information. In the same way that there are proteins and structures shown uh, in this image here of uh, the epigenome, uh, being able to decide which genes are turned on and off. And the way the cell actually does this physically is that the bundles of DNA are silent, in part done uh, mediated by these silent information regulators that we discovered control aging. And then there are loops of DNA that open up, and now the DNA can be read by the cell. And that has to be different in each type of cell. So a brain cell is going to have a different set of loops and bundles compared to a liver cell, compared to a skin cell, because all the DNA is, is the same in these cells. They have to be controlled differently. So in the same way that the cell controls its genes, a DVD player can play different chapters of a movie and will do so to make different stories. And what we proposed and have since discovered is that during aging, this reader becomes disrupted and starts to read the wrong genes in the genome, uh, plays the wrong chapters in the wrong order, and you get a terrible story. And in the case of the cell, you get a terrible uh, functioning cell. And we're proposing that many, if not all of the causes of aging uh, or the hallmarks of aging are related to changes in the epigenome. Um, and you could think of aging now as scratches on that DVD that prevent that beautiful uh, chapter story of, uh, of the movie from proceeding. And that's exciting because it means that the information to be young is still in our bodies. If you could just polish the DVD or reset the cell to remember how to read the right genes like they were young again, you could literally reverse aging. And we have just begun to do that in my lab and a few others around the world. So we're going to get to some of the experiments, exciting experiments that you've been doing. But Nir, when you, I'm sure you're familiar with David's theory. Does it resonate with your insights on, on aging? Sure. Look, there is a, a really striking example. We could take a sperm of a 90-year-old man and fertilize an egg of a 50-year-old woman, right? And, and we can check, we can actually measure the age. But when the, the blastocyst, when, when these babies start to develop, when the cell starts to divide, they start at zero, right? So we found a way to erase aging. But, uh, but I, I, I want to say something f in order to understand what we just heard. We, we mentioned the hallmarks of aging. How do you become a hallmark of aging? You have to show that it changes with aging. And if you fix it, you have effect on preclinical model, you know, on animals, you have effect on their health span and lifespan. And so it's not necessarily the causes of aging, right? It's just that that's what we have. And the interesting thing is that you fix one hallmark, you affect the other. And that's why we have this liberty to fight about the hierarchy, right? David said it's epigenetics and, and Laura said it's, uh, it's uh, senescent cells and, and the telomere, you know, and the telomeres. And you didn't ask me what's my, my hallmark. And, and I'm not saying there's no hierarchy, 
but uh, but 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 I'm saying the complexity is because we affect each other and we'll figure it out. And in my mind, what David is saying is for me the Peter Pan uh, hypothesis. I think that the easiest thing that we'll have in our field in the future, maybe 50 years from now, may maybe sooner with, with David, or if David lasts, <laughs> is we can take an, a 20 year old and erase his epigenetics and slow aging significantly because I think the easiest thing is not to age. I think to take an old person and make it young again is probably the hardest thing to do, although we've been doing that in a way. So I, I think the hierarchy will become uh, clear, but don't, don't, don't forget any, whatever is your favorite. You know, they, when they ask me, what's your favorite hallmark? I say, if you have eight daughters, do I ask you who's your favorite daughter? <laughs> I, I don't want to be yeah. in, in this situation. They're all my favorite. And by the way, the reason you don't want to commit is some of them are going to be targeted sooner than others, right? You don't want to get the investors to invest in something else when actually you can have success right away. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying just to be here the, uh, the, the moderator, the, the moderator of, of, of those things. So can you just quickly tell us what are, what are those hallmarks? I mean, we've spoken about some of them, but David, you mentioned nine that were focused upon. Nir, you just mentioned the number eight. Is there some master list of, of cellular uh, qualities that we will associate with aging? Well, yeah, we draw it as a pie chart and we give each slice the same amount of space. There are equal pies, but I don't think they're equal. And it also doesn't show that they're totally in interconnected. So, for example, uh, Laura talks about senescent cells a, a lot. And this clearly is a, is a problem during aging and drives the process. The, the end product of the dysregulation of the epigenome, the scratches on the DVD, we see is cellular senescence. We also see that telomere shortening disrupts the epigenome. We see that the epigenome changes disrupt nutrient sensing and energy production in the body, which is what NEAR studies. So I'm trying to unify us all and realize that we're just holding the same elephant from different ends. So what are these, what are the, what's this list? Well, we can debate how many there are, but there's roughly eight or nine. There's genomic instability and DNA mutations. There's the loss of telomeres, the loss of uh, protein homeostasis, which is Recycling of proteins, we get old proteins, gives us Alzheimer's, for example, macular degeneration. Deregulated nutrient sensing is, is like diabetes. Our bodies don't respond to nutrients anymore. Uh, we also have mitochondrial dysfunction, the energy, little power packs in the cell don't work well. Uh, you can have senescent cells that Laura is talking about, and stem cells are important as well. And then we throw in a ninth one, which would be epigenomic dysregulation that I've just described. Got it. So, Alyssa, we've been talking a lot now about the internal qualities of aging or markers of aging. You spend a lot of time thinking about the external effects of the environment or even a state of mind on the kind of aging that an individual goes through. I think you call this the exosome, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You can tell us what that is and, and the kinds of things that your research has revealed. Good question. The exposome is the sum of all of exposome. the things that Sorry. we are exposed to. Thank you for no, you were close. <laughs> and so it's uh, some of it's measurable, some of it's not. We tend to think of it as you know the chemicals and the air pollution and the you know how safe our neighborhood is that actually predicts you know health and mortality and population based data. And so a lot of the, the common pathway for these exposome factors is the stress response, the, the gene, body's generic chronic stress response. And that includes elevated levels of inflammation, uh, insulin resistance, and cortisol. And so that generic stress response is pro-aging when it goes on and on and on. So acutely, it helps us recover. We need it. It's healthy. In fact, acute stressors are fabulous for... Um, kind of exercising the muscle of our, you know, cellular resistance, our cellular stress response. But the chronic stress is wearing to these cellular systems. And uh, um, I think the, you know, the intrinsic aging that we're talking about and that these three amazing colleagues are uh, working on in a mechanistic way, it's so important to understand. It's so important to invest more money in studying these mechanisms. And we will eventually have some 
uh, some, you know, pills that will help us. We're all waiting. Um, we're getting closer. But the, the, the big factors that shape our aging are really are the biggest factors kind of, were you born to a wealthy family or were you born in poverty? And these socioeconomic factors um, are the biggest drivers of early disease and aging. So there's, so there's these kind of levels of um, predictors. We call that the social determinants of health. And then there's what we can control, our individual lifestyle and behavior, and of course our mindset, our um, levels of well-being and stress. All of these are associated with our health. And the what I'm so excited about and interested in is studying the hallmarks of aging and how these external factors, our social environment, our relationships, uh, factors related to climate change, and of course stress, how these speed up the drivers of aging, the biological drivers of aging. So when you talk about chronic stress, are there some concrete examples that you've studied which show that kind of ongoing stress has this impact on, on aging? Yes, yeah, so as, as an example, one of the typical ways we study stress is caregivers. And so we, they're under chronic stress, they're not able to take care of themselves. It's usually at least 10 years that someone is caring for a family member with dementia, or if it's a parent, it's, it could be lifelong caring for a, a child with a developmental disorder, et cetera. So those, in those models, we find telomere shortening, elevated levels of systemic inflammation. And we also find uh, accelerated epigenetic patterns that indicate aging, epigenetic clocks. The other factor that's associated with these um, aspects of cellular aging is traumatic early stress. So we also know that early, both prenatally and in childhood, severe stress is associated with a long shadow of accelerated aging. These, these same markers, mito poor mitochondria function, epigenetic aging, telomere shortening, and inflammation. And there's also a study you did, if I'm not mistaken, on, on the relationship between racism and aging. Give us a sense of what you found there. So there's been a um, now more than a handful of studies in population-based studies like um, the Health and Retirement Study by various groups, um, especially David Che uh, at Tulane. And these studies consistently find that ex greater experiences of discrimination predict not just shorter telomeres, but sh shorter um, greater rate of telomere shortening over time, over 10 years in the, in the last study that came out in 2020. So we do think that this is one form of systemic stress. We know that there are um, race differences in telomere length that we're still trying to figure out, but we're not gonna be able to measure systemic racism very well. We just uh, know that when we measure experiences of discrimination, it's related to telomere shortness in a dose response fashion. So if we turn now to how we can... I, can, uh, can I say something, yeah, just, just yeah. An, an example? I have an uh, uncle who's in my study. He's 99 years old with long telomeres. Now, when he was 16, uh, the Nazis killed his parents, took him, and he says, I had the tour of five concentration camps. He said the, the Nazis gave me the great tour, not enough food, but they paid for everything. And he survived that. He went to medical school in Prague, and in 1968, in the, the spring of Prague, he, he was an activist, so he had to escape from the Russians. He escaped, eventually got to Quebec, and the separatists have blown the house next to him, and then he went to Houston, and, you know, it's going on and on. He built now his house third time after Hurricane. Uh, so it's a, an example for somebody who had periods of stress <laughs> throughout his life, and, and you just think that it upgraded his ability to deal with stress. And I'm kind of hoping somewhat for a next hurricane to keep him alive, you know? But, but I think that, that demonstrates a little bit the levels of stress and what they do. Well, no doubt one's state of mind and how one deals with stress, Alyssa, presumably is a vital part of its impact on you physiologically, I presume. It's a beautiful example, Nir. Yep. So Laura, if we turn now to possible ways that we can start to deal with aging, I know that you've developed drugs that deal with some of the cell senescence that we were talking about earlier. What's the state of play on, on that 
kind of uh, pharmacological response to, to aging? Yeah, so it's a really exciting time in the field. Um, I think of senescent cells maybe not as a pillar or hallmark of aging, but the transducer of aging. So we have very strong genetic evidence that if you get rid of senescent cells, you will have less age-related diseases. And what's really exciting to me is, at least in, in mouse models, um, if you get rid of senescent cells through these genetic tricks, what you do is you extend median lifespan, but not necessarily maximum lifespan. So what I interpret that to mean is you've, you've blunted all-cause mortality in this population. And that's exciting. You really then, senescent cells are, are, are a foundation of all of these age-related diseases that we fear. So if you could do that with genetics, of course we were thinking, can we do this with drugs? And so we started developing um, what we call senotherapeutics. And they come in two flavors. One are a class of drugs that specifically kill these senescent cells. So the, the main goal there is to just get rid of the source of this chronic inflammation that happens with aging. And the others are senomorphics. So they alter the senescent cell phenotype and that dampens the, the inflammation. So you can approach it two different ways. And we've been using bioinformatic approaches to try and define senescent cells and sort of in a traditional pharmaceutical approach, look for molecular targets that would make a, a senescent cell very vulnerable to cell death. And then we've also just been doing screening so we can take in, in the laboratory plates of senescent cells and just apply drugs that exist, natural products that exist, and look for things that will selectively kill senescent cells. And it's just been tremendously exciting because the first senotherapeutics were identified in 2015 and we're already deep into numerous clinical trials. So the hope is we will know in a very short period of time if this approach to modify aging is really gonna work. And so you mentioned before that there are kind of good senescent cells and bad ones. Is there a way that these drugs can tell the difference between the two and, and just target the bad ones? That's a great question. So. Um, I think what we're struggling with right now in the field is a, a good definition of a senescent cell. And if, I, if it were my way you know, to, to organize all of this, we would probably call healthy senescent cells and uh, pathologic senescent cells something different so that we, we could even linguistically discriminate. But I can promise you at this point, drugs cannot. And so we have to think very carefully about how to apply senolytics in particular to get the benefits without adverse outcomes. I mean, when do they go bad? Is there, is there a well-defined process that, that there's a transitioning or are some just good and some just bad from the get-go? Well, I think they, what we think of is the healthy senescent cells are, are transient, which makes no sense when we're talking about a stable or irreversible cell cycle arrest. And, and, and so it's, it's also plays into the immune system. If, if, uh, an acute situation like wound healing requires senescent cells, you can drive senescence, attract the immune system in, close that wound very expeditiously, but then clear away those senescent cells. So I think short-lived versus chronic that hang around, your body can't get rid of them, and they're just kind of festering like a, a rotten apple corrupting the bushel. But a drug is not going to be sophisticated enough to tell the difference yet until we can define senescent cells with much greater clarity. Right. So, David, with your perspective, the unified approach to aging, what is your prescription for how we might address it? Well, first of all, we should all know that we can do a lot in our current lives in the way we live. Um, we should talk a bit, little bit maybe later about the kind of things that we do ourselves to try and uh, slow down the aging process. Um, in terms of pharmaceutical development, uh, Laura's really one of the leaders in finding molecules that can address uh, one of the major hallmarks of aging. Uh, one of the things that I find uh, it surprises people is to learn how many clinical trials are ongoing and how many positive results we've had from this field. We have positive results in humans for senolytics. We have positive results already for these NAD boosting molecules in the field that we work on and telomere extension, there's some good uh, early results there. And of course, NIRS field, which is nutrient sensing and type two diabetes, 
Uh, we have a drug called metformin, which I think is the leading candidate for a safe longevity drug that's already prescribed by doctors. And so what I would say is, um, well, I've actually you know, written a book on this to say what I think could be done in people's lives, both lifestyle and supplements and one day medicines. Um, and it's, it's a long list, but the way to think of it is you want to put your body in a state of perceived adversity because the body has its own repair systems that become lazy if you sit around and you're always fed and you're always the right temperature. And we can either do those uncomfortable things and get our bodies to wake up, so do some exercise, eat less often, eat foods that themselves are being stressed. We can also take molecules such as the drug metformin that Nir is an expert in, or a senolytic drug, or a telomere extender that actually mimic this adversity, uh, which in combination with a healthy lifestyle, uh, I think will have remarkably strong benefits on longevity, um, if not uh, delaying these diseases that uh, come way too early, in my opinion. So concretely, how when you talk about stress there, I mean, uh, Alyssa was talking about how you've got you know, acute and chronic stress, perhaps from a psychological perspective, and, and the acute is better than the chronic in terms of how we respond. Are you basically saying the same thing at a more physiological level, that we need to strain ourselves in a way that that's aligned with the acute stress that we were talking about before? Yeah, well, let, let's separate psychological stress from biological stress. When I say stress and adversity, I'm meaning uh, the body reacting to what it perceives as uh, the chance that it could die next week from, from you know, getting eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or starving for a lack of food. But you don't want to go there. You don't want to have to starve or be chased down by a predator to actually get this longevity. So we mimic it. So uh, instead of prescribing things, because I'm, I'm just a PhD and we don't know the full answer, of course, I like to talk about what I do and, my, and sometimes what my father does and daily, um, which I'm happy to do. Yeah, please. Right now, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Um, all right, well, so... Um, there are three main staples, um, and I've actually added a fourth based on uh, Laura's work. Uh, I still take a, a gram of resveratrol every morning uh, with a bit of yogurt to dissolve it because it, it doesn't dissolve in water. And that activates the sirtuin enzyme we've, and many others have shown now. Seems to be very safe in humans, so the risk is low. And remind us, the sirtuin with, enzyme is the one that helps repair the epigenome? Is that the... Uh... In part. So yeah, the sirtuins, there are seven of them in the body. And, they do various activities. They boost mitochondria. They seem to slow senescence. They even protect the telomere ends of the chromosomes. But one of their main functions, in fact, the, the reason they were first linked to aging was their critical role in slowing down aging of the epigenome, these scratches on the DVD. And so by taking resveratrol, the hope has been that I will be resistant to a bad diet, which we've shown in animals, uh, but also it will slow down the ticking of the aging clock. And I didn't know if that was going to happen 13, 14 years ago when I started, uh, but it certainly hasn't done me any harm so far. But again, the supplements are unproven, so I'm not advocating for this. I'm just telling you what I've chosen to do. The next thing is an NAD booster, which is NAD is a molecule that also is fuel for these protective sirtuin enzymes in the body. And then the third component actually is what near... Is that a pill? Is that a pill that... that I mean, how do you boost that NAD? Um, so resveratrol is a powder that I just keep around. Um, I, NMN is a capsule. Uh, I take a gram of that every day in the morning. And then at night I take uh, a gram of metformin, which is the type two diabetes drug. Now, that might strike people as strange that I don't yet have type two diabetes. I might eventually get there, but I'm taking it as a preventative, not just of type two diabetes, but based on the evidence, it's probably going to slow down the development of cancer, heart disease, and even Alzheimer's based on um, retrospective studies of tens of thousands of people. And those are the three main ones. The fourth one that I've added that, uh, that Laura doesn't even know is I'm taking uh, a molecule that she ha and her team has shown extends lifespan in mice, and that's physetin. And so I do take that uh, regularly as well, in the hopes that it will do what Laura says is good, uh, kill off and slow down the formation of senescent cells. But also what's not widely known is that we discovered physetin, the same molecule activates these sirtuins as well. We showed that back in 2003. So you get a double whammy for physetin. So I sometimes throw that in the yogurt as well. But can we get all those pills at like GNC? Is this all widely publicly available? Or are you going to like the reserves over there in the Harvard lab and just picking it off the shelf? Oh boy, Brian, you're gonna get me in trouble. No, I don't raid the lab at Harvard, that's for sure. 
Um, I'm very careful to uh, go for suppliers of these molecules that are trusted brands and that they're 100% or near 100% pure. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the supplement world is filled with uh, a number of products that are untrustworthy. Some of them don't even have the product in them. Unfortunately, it's not well regulated. Um, so I'm very careful to do that. And also, I think if somebody wants to look at supplements, they should look for what's called GMP, good manufacturing practices or procedures. Um, and this helps guarantee that the people making the product actually uh, do take extra care. Right. But it's, it's hard, I admit. Um, but I also want to say that I'm not just popping pills. I do what I, uh, what I also believe is good for health, which is uh, I eat well. So it's more like a Mediterranean diet. It's more vegan these days. I avoid sugar and I eat uh, one and a half times a day, which I also believe uh, is going to help my ultimate longevity. But I'm not so worried about my, my own death. I'm not scared of death. I, I do like experimenting and, and it's kind of a competition to see who can be the healthiest and longest lived at this point. <laughs> Yeah. So, so Laura, how does it make you feel when David says that he's taken a, a, a drug that you were involved with that you didn't even know that he was taking? Is that, again, something that um, is out there in the world and, and is something that you would suggest people to take? Or does it surprise you to hear that? It does not surprise me at all because David is very adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and, and I'm flattered. And I have to say back at you, David, because I tried taking NAD precursors because I believe in your work so strongly. But I am a, a test case and an example. I got horribly sick off of commercial products because you really, and this is from reputable companies as well. So you do have to be extremely careful. The other thing I would caution is the doses that David are, is talking about has nothing to do with what's on the back of a bottle. So there's not really good guidance out there for the average consumer. So I would urge a lot of caution, let the studies happen. Facetin is being tested in a number of clinical trials right now. We do know that it clears senescent cells. So just wait for those, those scientific studies to come out because it, you won't have to wait too long. So, Nir, metformin was described as one of the drugs that at least David and perhaps others are taking, a drug that you've been deeply involved with. Tell us about that. And again, is it something where you feel that there's evidence supporting the idea that this is a longevity-aiding uh, drug? Sure. So, it's interesting. I came as a fellow to Yale in, 1970, in 1987, and my project was to find the mechanism of action of metformin, which was a drug that was used in Europe, but, but people said it should be used in the United States too. And so I'm on the first paper that described this mechanism of action of metformin that's related to diabetes. But I knew then that diabetes was kind of a side effect of metformin because metformin was used to prevent flu and malaria and to treat inflammatory disease when it was discovered that it also lowers glucose in diabetics, okay? But, but I didn't think much about it until much later when it started to be clear that there is a whole geroscience we call it not anti-aging, we call it geroscience part of metformin. Actually, papers like David, who showed that the clinical dose of metformin extends lifespan in animal, and the fact that it increased health span even much more profoundly and, and significantly. And then the realization that metformin hits all the hallmark of aging. And by the way, does it affect all the hallmarks of aging? Part of this hallmark story is that if you have a drug that actually takes an old cell or an old organ or an old body and make younger, then you repair lots of things. <laughs> so you see the epigenetic improves and you see, so it looks like it, it, it corrects everything. But the reason I took metformin is not because of my own research, but actually is part of our leadership that Metformin seemed to be the right way, the right tool, I, I'm, I'm calling it a tool, to go to the FDA and say, hey, look, you have a drug that we want to repurpose to target aging. So let's talk about it. Let's do the study that will show that when we give metformin, we're targeting aging, which means we're going to target not one or two or three diseases, but all those diseases and mortality. And, and then 
you know, we can call it aging, we don't have to call it aging, but at least we have a template and an outcomes that will show that it's happening. Now, the preliminary data, and David, you said association studies. Most of the studies in metformin that we have are clinical studies, okay? Clinical study is that they took patients and some of them got that and some of them get placebo or another effect. So metformin prevents diabetes compared to placebo. Metformin uh, prevents cardiovascular disease compared to other, to other drugs. Metformin prevents the deterioration in mild cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, the cancer is more of association, but there are 250 association studies that all show that no matter what cancer, actually, maybe not in prostate, but all other cancers, if you give metformin, you get 30% less, less of those cancers. And there's a really good study on mortality that showed that people who take metformin, 78,000 people, in the study, there were almost 200,000, but the 78,000 people on metformin uh, that have diabetes had less mortality than people without diabetes. And they, were, they had diabetes, they were more obese, they were more sick in the beginning, and they still had better, uh, less mortality. So if you take all of it together, you see that this is the perfect tool. And remember, it mi we might have better drugs, but we don't want to kill anyone on the way to, succeed, to success. We want to do the right study at the right time with the right population and show that we're moving, no matter what disease you're going to get, you'll get it later or not at all in a five-year window. So Alyssa, when you hear about all these drugs that you know, various of your colleagues have been working on and even taking themselves, how do you think about them in reference to your work, which shows that there's such an impact of, of the external world? I mean, if you had the greatest pill in the world, but the external world doesn't change, do you think you're gonna have the effects that these drugs are, are seeking? I have been very skeptical because aging is so complex with so many redundant mechanisms. I never thought we'd get here. Um, I also know that our behaviors are so strong, they can override the drug effects. So for example, a diabetic taking metformin, it's gonna protect them to the, um, only to a certain extent. If they are chronically eating over processed food and high sugar, and it's not gonna keep them the, uh, insulin sensitive. So you know what we can do can ruin the drug effect and override it. And um, these are pretty strong effects that we're talking about, the chronic stress, being sedentary, junk food, the, but um, I have, I think I've drunk the Kool-Aid. This research is really, really exciting now. Um, I pretty much uh, take what David takes, partly based on <laughs> your research and the research we've talked about here. And you know, I, there's always risk, right? We don't have the careful dose response studies. I'm not gonna wait five years. I'm gonna, you know, we're always kind of doing what we think is safe um, ahead of the, you know, the longitudinal studies that just take too long. So, so David, there, there are studies, obviously, that need to be done of, of these drugs, their effects on, on humans. You've definitely done some powerful work already with mice that have shown the capacity to reverse certain kind of cellular damage and so forth. Can you have a sense of, of what that is? Well, there's, there's been a lot done over the last 20 years, um, not just by my lab, but, but by dozens of others. Um, and it may be a surprise to, not, to learn that there are... Oh, probably close to 70 companies now working on aging to develop molecules to slow down and treat the process and, and diseases that result from that, by, mostly by turning on the, cell, the cell's natural defenses against aging. Um, and so what's come out of, out of my lab are a couple of main areas. I talked about the red wine molecule called resveratrol. There are molecules that, that act like that uh, on humans, and they had positive results in a disease called psoriasis, uh, skin inflammation. We also have NAD boosters, which also activate this, these same enzymes that protect the body. And we have been do we've been doing clinical trials for the last two and a half years, no adverse effects, uh, early results look promising. And then a third area that we haven't yet gone into humans yet, but I think is even more exciting and controversial is actual reprogramming the epigenome to re literally reverse the age of parts of the body and perhaps one day the entire body. Now that's still in mice, and actually we're now in non-human primates to test the safety, 
But ultimately, what I hope in the next two years is we will treat our first patient. And what we're focusing on is not reversing the whole body aging. That would be too much to, to try first up. But what we'd like to do is reverse blindness. So in mice, we published that we can reverse the age of an old eye and cure blindness. And that's what we're going to focus on in humans if we can do it. And if you try to immediately apply that technique to the whole body of the mouse, have you tried to do that? Is there something that goes wrong? Uh, no, nothing goes wrong. Uh, actually, it goes very right. We know that we can reverse the age, not just of the optic nerve, and make it regrow and get back the age of the eye so that it functions normally again. We've also tested it on, well, first of all, different parts of the eye. We can do different parts of the retina. We've now done skin. We've uh, been able to control aging very carefully and precisely in the brain of a mouse. We can drive it in the forwards direction, make it get old, get dementia get Alzheimer's or a form of Alzheimer's. And then the cool part is we can now reverse the age of the brain. We infect the brain with three embryonic genes, turn them on. The brain of the mouse gets young again, and it gets its ability to learn again. Uh, it actually, we think it might even get lost memories back again. So we're, there's nothing that I can see yet that makes me concerned. I mean, one possibility is that it could make the cells too young, and a very, very young cell is a tumor. We don't want that. But I think we've been very lucky, actually, to discover that there's a combination of just three genes that we, we put in the cells that uh, seem to be really quite safe. And if we turn those genes on for over a year in a mouse and just blast it through the whole mouse, we don't get any evidence of tumors. In fact, we see fewer tumors. Now, the question is, do they live longer? And we're, of course, doing that right now. Uh, we actually, unfortunately, had to kill our mice uh, because the reviewers of our paper that we published a year ago insisted that we look at their organs, uh, so we needed to do that. So we're repeating that experiment with, in fact, better delivery systems for the gene therapy so that we can get more even distribution of these embryonic genes, and we'll see. Um, but it's super exciting times to be able to potentially reset the body of an animal, not just once, but many times, and then you know, all bets are off if it even works slightly in humans. David, if you allow your, your, your NAD-boosted fertile imagination to run wild and imagine that things go as best as they possibly can in, say, the next 50 years, what would it be like if this kind of protocol were to be applied to humans? Would you, would you go every so often to get sort of a, a treatment and you'd leave the spa feeling like 15 years younger kind of thing? What, what would it be like? Yeah, well, I, I'm enthusiastic like Alyssa just expressed that where we are now, I didn't believe we could get to in my lifetime. And just the last few years with works, work on telomeres and senolytics and metformin, it, it makes my head spin how quickly this is moving. So it's very hard to see 50 years into the future, let alone five. But I could imagine a future, we, we have the technology now, at least in mice, and there's no reason why it shouldn't work in humans, to reset the age of the body to extend telomeres, to delete the senescent cells, or even cure them using our technology, um, and reset the age of the body, not just by one year, but by 10 years or more. And interestingly, if you think about it, if you just go back one year every birthday, uh, you don't die. Now, we're not there yet, but I could see in 50 years that it would be commonplace for people to reset their age every decade, and then just age out again and get another treatment by a doctor. I mean, how long do you imagine this could, could go on, this cycle, indefinitely? Probably not indefinitely. There are things that happen to the genome. We do get mutations, and that's information that may be irretrievable. But, you know, I, there is no limit to biological age in humans. There are plenty of species that live for thousands of years, and there are very closely related mammals, uh, the whales, that live 200 years. So, you know, when somebody says, oh, we've reached our maximum, you know, I'm happy to debate that. I think that that's wrong and that we can learn from these other species how they manage to have fewer senescent cells, fewer telomere losses, and a very stable epigenome. And when we apply that knowledge, I don't see why we can't have people 50 years from now who are reaching, you know, dare I say it, 150. Because it, think about this, the longer you live, the better this technology gets. And uh, so the idea now is we need to stay alive as this technology comes online and live longer. And the longer we live, the longer we will live. So, so we could be that like transition generation where we just missed it by a, by a couple years or something of that sort? 
it could be. We could be the last generation that lives a normal, pathetic human lifespan, and future generations will take pity on us. Well, with that as a transition, I just want to go on to maybe some of the philosophical or ethical issues here. Is everybody on board that we should be doing this? I mean, we're all speaking as if the goal of living longer is, is the right goal and, and pursuing it is the right thing. I think we'd all agree that being healthier for longer, I think that's pretty incontrovertible, right? We want to do that. That's not a controversial statement. But, you know, you could say that natural selection, right, it, it, it wanted us to survive to the age of reproduction. And after that, it doesn't care so much about us from that perspective. Should we be messing with that natural rhythm? Look, life expectancy for tens of thousands of years was like between 25 and 35. And, and we made this deal with the devil and we said we we're unhappy, you know, because there were always old people who were doing well, right? And, and so the devil said, fine, I'll give you water, I'll give you sores, I'll give you immunization, I'll give you surgery. And what did we get? <laughs> we got a bunch of terrible age-related diseases, right? So do we need to accept that? Um, I, I'm more worried, uh, not, not that people will understand that health span is important. I think that maybe we're making another deal with the devil and in 50 years there'll be new diseases, okay? But when we'll get there, we'll, we'll know about it. But I, I don't see if we agree that aging drives diseases and we want to prevent it, I don't see why the individual will care so much. And let, let me give you the example that really drives me. Our centenarians, it's not only that they live long, okay? They live healthier. They get diseases 30 years after a current cohort get diseases. And, and even at age 100, 30% of our centenarians don't have any disease, okay? And this is not really the important thing, that they live longer and, and their health span was increased, but they have what's called the contraction of morbidity. We're sick five, eight years at the end of our life, and they're sick for between, <laughs> not, not at all, to few weeks or months. This contraction of morbidity also has been shown by, the, the impact of that has been shown by the CDC who shows that the medical cost in the last two years of life of somebody who dies after the age of 100 is third of those who die when they're 70. And our centenarians, when they were 70, they didn't even go to the doctor. And this has been translated to a longevity dividend. So it's not only, it's not only the health span that is good, okay? It's, it's how much we are freeing the economy. And in fact, David, David, you should talk about the Andrew Scott uh, paper because when, when the elderly are, are healthy, it's not only the medical expense. They travel, they shop. <laughs> the value that they contribute is increasing. So there is a personal medical reason for you to be healthy and die very shortly or not without any disease. And there's a motivation for our economy to free huge amount of, of money that we spend on treating diseases that should have been prevented to begin with. Laura, you have a similar view or different? I agree completely with Nir. I think it's our moral obligation to tackle this. It's, it's the greatest biomedical problem that we kind of created by having all of these advanced researches that took away early life diseases. And, and we have to tackle this now. We don't have a hospital system that can accommodate so many elderly with multiple diseases of old age. We don't have the doctors, we don't have the caregivers. Um, and, but I'm also a little skeptical about how well it's ultimately gonna work because of this huge elephant in the room that Alyssa talks about, the environment. We have to clean up everything if we're really gonna get the most benefit from this. And Alyssa, so what's your overall view? Is this uh, the, the, the right goal that, that we should pursue vigilantly? I have a question for my colleagues instead of answering. And I like what you said, um, Laura and Nir, and I love uh, your, um, your vision, David. Um, but really, I think it's a question for David. If we live to 150 years, how do you see us um, doing what we, you know, we kind of call carbon offsets. You know, how do we, we have 7 billion people. We have overpopulation. 
we have, uh, we have, I'm not gonna say an unpredictable future. We have a future of worsening and worsening of the climate crisis. We have an unstable climate. We will have famines. We have pro we're gonna have problems with bread baskets and immigration and, uh, and so I'm just curious, you know, how does this fit in if we're, if we're living longer, if we're really talking about population health, not just elite health, you know, people of extreme wealth being able to live long, but if we're really able to extend life, how do we balance that with the Earth's health? Well, it, it clearly goes along with this. And the good news is that um, when people are living longer uh, and healthier, as Nir said, uh, there are huge savings. So I co-published with uh, Andrew Scott, uh, a London economist, that the value just to the economy in the US of using, let's say, metformin to give people an extra year of healthy life, one year, the value to the economy in the long run is $86 trillion with a T. And if you live another 10 years, it's $365 trillion. This is savings, this isn't expenditure, right? So it, it's the best way to take money out of waste out of the sick care system rather than the healthcare system, as we call it, and put it into other things that we need to do. But why not you can compress do, you can do morbidity? There's no question that compressing morbidity, what Nir laid out, is, is a necessary goal. We're, you know, we're so sick and we spend, and we have a bankrupt healthcare system as well as a burnt out healthcare system. So the, the compression morbidity, yes. I mean, this is why these drugs are just so important. But it's the living the extra 50 years. Even if we're well, healthy, this is all, an extra burden on the earth. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's not a good thing to say uh, we want people to die to save money. You know, in 1840, people were complaining there were too many people. What are we going to do with all this horse manure? Uh, too many sick people. And we, we engineered our way out of it. London's now a great place to live and there's at least three times as many people in the city. Science can fix things. Now, that's why we're here, that's why we're talking today. And there are solutions to this. And I don't think the answer is, okay, let's just make sure we don't let people live longer. Otherwise we should stop doing medical research right now. Great point. And I would love to hear from our colleagues about this you know, science, the ability to do this. Um, and wisdom, the wisdom of doing this. So can, can, I, can I make a, 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 another point? Let me ask you, let, let me ask you, and I'm, I'm doing a provocation now, okay? Um, so we need, it's not about elderly only. You know, people who survive cancer and chemotherapy, which are aging, by the way, they get age-related disease very soon after kids are getting heart disease at 35. We need to help them. People with HIV get diseases 10 years ahead, okay? People who are disabled. Let's talk about poor people, okay? Poor people live, de depending, everywhere in the world, depending on the extent, but in the United States, 15 years less than people with middle income, okay? So, so let's talk about it uh, for a second, because uh, you're saying that the best thing to do with poor people is, first of all, they're not eating well, right? They're eating too many calories that are not appropriate for them. They don't do fish. They don't know vegetables and fruits because they're expensive. And even if they were not expensive, they don't like them. Uh, those people also do not exercise because the gym is lots of money and it's not available. And because Peloton, they cannot afford or, or, or treadmills. So... I think one of the options is to give them metformin, okay? Which, by the way, have been working better in poor people than in, in, in rich people in, in, in studies that we're looking at that. Now, for every dollar of metformin, it's estimated that we need to spend $100,000 in order to improve their diet and exercise, which, by the way, I'm totally in favor. It's just a huge risk. So don't you think that in a certain way, uh, we'll have to deal with diet, we'll have to deal with exercise, but wouldn't it'll be good to have drugs that will have the people who cannot get there? Nir, if you're asking me, absolutely. What I'm asking about is the 100 to 150 years. I'm asking, is that wise? 
So, so my, my answer to that, look, that's why, and David knows that, I'm, I'm trying f to answer these questions. I'm trying to say, look, maximum lifespan of human species today is about 115 years. We can argue about it. Somebody lived to be 122. And, but we die before the age of 80, so there are 35 years that we can realize, and even that will take time to realize. But that doesn't mean a, that we cannot break it, and B, that we shouldn't try to work on it right now. But, but I think, I, I, but I think, but that, that kind of answers, it's a different, I think it's a different scientific goal. It's a, little, a, a, a different scientific technology. And let's do it in stages. Let's start with being healthy within our capacity and in the meantime, figuring maybe to do it so it, it's not a burden at all. So in this final minute, I just want to shift somewhat more philosophical, if you're willing to go with me. There, uh, you know, the, the great psychologist Otto Rank and then the cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker, they both emphasize, as well as many other thinkers and writers, how human mortality plays a vital role in the lives that we lead, the decisions we make, the motivations for our various behaviors, how we find meaning in our lives is often reflected on the fact that we all know that we're going to die. Now, if we are able to push off mortality, perhaps in the way that David suggests, to 150, or maybe you just keep going back and get those treatments and maybe it goes on even longer, maybe to a thousand years, do you think that we as a species are going to find it more difficult to find meaning and purpose within that context? Or do we just ultimately acclimate to the new lifespan and that will be the norm and we just go forward from there? Any thoughts on that, Laura? I think actually it would have a very positive impact on our view of, of meaning. I mean, if you take the life cycle of a scientist, we barely get good before we're incapacitated as old scientists. So, you know, we spend so much effort during our scientific lives training the next generation because we know we're not going to finish the story. So at least as a scientist, I, I can imagine as a dancer to be able to dance longer. I mean, it would give so much meaning to, to just extend quality life. David, your view on that? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I don't think most of us think about mortality each day. You know, our, our experience is what happened last month, what's going to happen in two months from now. And anything beyond that's not really in our thought very much. And, you know, far be it for me to, to disagree with philosophers um, and anthropologists, but uh, in my, my view, having been a human for 52 years, I don't get up every morning worried I'm going to die. I get up every morning because it's a thrill to be alive and I'm just excited about what I'm doing that day. And as long as I'm healthy and I have friends and family around, I don't see why that would want, need to end, necessarily why the fear of it ending makes me happier and dr more driven. I don't see that at all. Now, other people may be driven by a fear of death, but I think most of us are just happy to have a good day and hang out uh, and do something that we find purposeful. And if that's being done in a healthy way at age 100, 120, and I'm sure Nir can talk about this with people he works with, that their fear of death, I don't think, is a major driver of our, our happiness and, uh, and what we do each day. So Nir, what do you find? I mean, the super agers that we began with, do they have an attitude that somehow is different from the attitude of others? Do they find meaning in longevity? Do you think that's where things will ultimately turn out to be? Well, f first, I want to make clear that I'm not immortalist. In fact, if, if it's true that this world, is got, this planet is going to survive for 12 billion years, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm tired for some things again. I mean, how many, I don't know, Trumps we'll see, how many disasters <laughs> we'll see. So look, with the centenarians, who some of them are, a lot of them are very active. They're painters, they're working. Uh, they're, you know, I have a centenarian who's going to the office. He has a hedge fund, $720 million, goes every, every day to, to the office and say, if he'll be fired, he'll buy the company to work. When you have health spam, okay, you don't want to stop. You don't want to stop working. You don't want to go to the theater. What, what's making aging terrible is the diseases. It's not the chronological age. 
So I, I, I think it's something that we have to try to provide. So Alyssa, I know that you have some qualms about the 100 to 150 range, whether we should even target human lifespan to lie within that. If it turns out that, you know, you guys, any of you on this discussion here, figure out how to achieve that, will you opt in when the time comes? <laughs> that That is, it's always um, a good question to do that type of predicting. I love this discussion about purpose. I don't think we would lose purpose. I think it's like um, my colleagues have said that, you know, at least from our perspective, we're all privileged. If the purpose in life is partly to, to leave the world a better place, to reduce suffering, we, what an exciting time this is. We love our work. You know, this is, um, this is, you know, getting up every day excited about what we can do, what we can learn. But I want to bring in another view about purpose. There's another big trend that is here that we, we really shouldn't ignore. And that is, well, I agree with Nir that well-being and vitality is, is really about health. And we will have no problem being productive members if we have health span. I also think mental health is an equally important part of the picture. And here's what's happening. We have a mental health crisis. We already did before COVID. We have 126 million new cases of anxiety and depression over the past year. But here's what I'm most concerned about. A worldwide survey of youth in 10 countries showed that 77% feel the future is frightening. And why shouldn't they? We really are going to be facing so many more climate disasters and, and problems. That is predict. That is not just a prediction, it's models for that. Uh, we don't know exactly for how long, but it will be our whole lifetime. Here's what's worse. 56% of youth globally feel the humanity is doomed. So depression, annihilism, lack of meaning, not wanting to have kids, all of this is here now and part of our future. So. I, for me personally, I'm so excited about what's coming in pharmaceuticals to increase health span, but I am less concerned about longevity over 100. I feel there are, um, I'm turning my efforts more toward, uh, toward looking at what we can do in my area, which is understanding behavioral science of health and mental health toward uh, climate to climate mitigation issues. And that is a more immediate and big impact on our mental health and our, our physical health. So I just want to keep that in the picture here when we think about living to 150. Yeah, no, it's absolutely but, vital. I, I vital just want context. to say something that uh, David, David started, and, and I want to double down on that, that uh, look, uh, the COVID, right? Infectious disease showed that we have to uh, not only rejuvenate, right, the immune system, but the whole body so it's resilient against severe diseases, right? So we need to do aging for those disasters that are coming. It's the same for climate change. You know, we need better body when we age if we're going to live in temperature of 90 degrees. So I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. I think it's part of it. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion one final question before we uh, wrap up. If you're willing, I'd love for each of you to just give a, a, a guess, a prognostication of where you think, again, subject to all of the caveats we've been talking about, in the best of all worlds, if the science goes spectacularly, if we cure all the issues with the drugs, if we are able to deal with climate change, if we don't blow ourselves up, human lifespan in say 500 years near, just give us a number, where do you, where do you think it's gonna be? Um. 500 years, I, I, well, I, for sure by then we would break, we, we would break the, this 115 record. Look, if we're going to space, and if there are aliens, by the way, that will come here, they've solved aging, right? Because they're coming farther than Mars. I mean, if we're going to Mars without solving aging, we'll never get there healthy and we'll never make it back. <laughs> Okay, so if they're aliens that many people believe, they solve aging before they'll come here. So I, I think that's, if that's 500 years, that's what I'll say. I'll say we solved aging. We're not going to age 
dramatically by them. So one thing I'll just give on that, if the aliens have solved the problem of traveling near the speed of light, then because of special relativistic time dilation, they may not have cracked the actual physiological problem of aging, but but maybe you're right. If they're doing it at slow speeds, then you're definitely correct. Alyssa, any the thoughts? The physicist, the physicist yeah, sorry, speaks I, I couldn't authoritatively. Help it. I couldn't help it. Uh, <laughs> Alyssa, thoughts on, on where you think the human lifespan will be in, in say 500 years? I think that if we are still alive, we will have had major, um, massive transitional shifts in our culture. And uh, we can't do this the way we're, we're living now, um, which is, you know, in a, a competitive world with guns. I mean, gun sales have never been as high this year in the States, at least. I mean, it's just we're going to need to build our resilience, our hormetic stress responses and our compassion for each other and not be so insular and tribal. And then we'll have a chance of actually building, using our resources in a better way. So for me, I'm, you know, I really uh, have my eye on purpose and life, quality of life and health span. And I'm, I'm less obsessed with the years, but I leave that, you know, to my brilliant colleagues here. Laura, any, any thoughts on a number that we can imagine the human lifespan being in say 500 years? I would defer to David and say, if it was 150, that would be lovely. Um, But I think that's only going to be what's possible. I think the average lifespan is probably not going to change dramatically because of all of these other circumstances that impinge upon it. And so what I like to think of in terms of a scientific success is if we can get everybody to 85 or 100 healthy, that's going to be a huge win. Yep. David, final words, where do you think things are going to be? It's pretty easy to extend lifespan uh, of yourself. Uh, it's been shown that if you just do what we know is good, eat right, don't overdrink, don't overeat, exercise, sleep well, have friends, uh, you can live another 14 years over it if you didn't do those things. Smoking also is, is a problem. So if you smoke, please try to quit. So that you can get 14 years pretty, pretty easily. If you add those technologies we talked about today and ones we can imagine resetting the body multiple times, and I don't see why it wouldn't be possible in 500 years for someone who's just had their 150th birthday to be having a midlife crisis. Um, I think eventually the sky's the limit. I think aliens would have already solved this and they'd come to our planet and they'd say, look at these pathetic humans. They're still debating whether this is even worth doing. How sad is that? That means they're not yet uh, qualified to be in the club of uh, advanced civilizations until they've figured that out and at least realize that that's a problem they need to solve. And the fact that it's natural and it's not yet solvable has nothing to do with whether we should work on it. In fact, it makes it more important because 100,000 people die every day in horrible ways because of aging. So I think that uh, in in the future, sky's the limit. We already know species can live for many hundreds of years mammals such as whales. So I I look forward to that kind of a world, but I also agree with Alyssa that we can't just make people healthier and live longer. We have to make the planet livable, otherwise it's not worth it. Absolutely. So with that, I just hope that all of you will agree that if you are successful, that you will rejoin me in the year 2322 so we can have another conversation on human longevity, human health span, (laughs) and, and hopefully the issue of the climate will be long in the rearview mirror. We will long have resolved that. So thank you so much for- I'll be the oldest. I'll be the oldest. <laughs> it, won't, it won't matter at that point. But yes, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, it was everyone. fun. <laughs>